Hello and welcome to today's latest offering of continuing professional education. I'm Mitch Arpit from the law firm of Tribler, Arpit and Meyer in Chicago and currently chair of Eagle International Associates. This webinar is brought to you by Eagle and is just one of a series of conferences and panel discussions dealing with important issues and challenges of significance to claims professionals and defense lawyers uh, around the world. We're really delighted that you've joined us today for this program. Before we begin, uh, let me give you a quick word about Eagle and who we are and uh, point you to some additional resources that we have available for you. Eagle is an association of defense lawyers and insurance adjusters throughout the United States, Canada, and parts of Western Europe. After review, excuse me, after review, we admit one or two members uh, from each, uh, from firms in each of the various states and provinces and from other countries. We all work with insurance companies, corporate litigation departments and risk managers and devote most of our practice to the service of companies and their insureds in defense of claims. Eagle members are dedicated to the service of the insurance industry, to providing highest quality professional service and offering additional value to our clients through sharing our resources, offering five or six live conferences a year when safety permits us to, to do so, and uh, when it doesn't, to uh, offering programs, or uh, sorry, uh, offering programs like this on a remote basis when people can't travel or we can't gather together safely. We also publish uh, articles several times a year and have compendiums and publications uh, that deal with national surveys on important issues. One such example of, of the publications we have would be a bad faith compendium uh, where you can click online, get to a specific jurisdiction and uh, be brought into a discussion of the governing law in that area with links available to the statutes that uh, may govern your claim. So uh, if you visit us at our website, which is www.eagle-law.com, uh, you can find listings of programs such as this, some of the other uh, remote programs that we're doing, uh, and, and also of the various publications we have that are available to you. You could also click on and get to know the firms who are members of Eagles, the individuals who are active in the organization, who we are, what we do, where we're located, we're happy to talk to you. Our Eagle members are happy to talk to you. So feel free if you have a question, uh, you need help finding somebody or something, uh, give, us, give us a call. We're happy to address or send us an email. And uh, we're confident that through our vast network, we can help you find solutions to problems and uh, get you answers to whatever questions you may have. Again, that uh, website is www.eagle-law.com. So again, thanks today for joining us. We hope you enjoy the program. And I will turn you over at this point. I should add one other thing. Uh, in addition to the live programs that we do in various spots around the country, one of the services that we have offered in the past and continue to do so, uh, are programs specifically for a uh, client or a company. So if you have a, an issue that you would love to see us come in and, and have us address for you or your, your colleagues at your company, we're happy to do so. We, we come from around the country, uh, happy to visit with you and share uh, items and issues for discussion, put on panel programs and uh, deal directly with you. If you have any uh, thoughts along those lines, feel free to contact me, uh, our, our executive director, Terry Napolitani, or any Eagle member listed on the uh, webpage, and we'll be happy to talk with you about that. So again, thanks uh, for joining us. Enjoy the program. And I will now turn you over to our conferences chair, Lindsay, Wood Lindsay Woodrow from the Waldeck firm in Minnesota. Waldeck firm is our Eagle member for the states of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Lindsay. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, as Mitch mentioned, I am the Eagle Conferences Chair and I wanna welcome you to Eagle's webinar platform. We hope that you find this webinar informative and useful. Um, as Mitch mentioned, we do do some in-house seminars. This particular webinar that you've selected to watch today is part of a larger five-hour in-house seminar that we did for 
uh, an insurance carrier that Eagle does a large amount of work with. And so you may hear some glitches or references to other subjects or other panels throughout the course of this particular topic. We apologize for that, but really wanted to bring you this program broken down into individual separate webinars so that you all can pick and choose what's relevant to your work and your interests. So with all of that, let's talk about the webinar that you all clicked on to watch today. This one is titled Beating Back Bias in Insurance Claims Before It Beats on You, a discussion of implicit bias in the settlement of claims and the dangers faced if unresolved. We've got three great Eagle members uh, who put together this webinar and we actually have somebody who's not an Eagle member uh, who agreed to participate. So let me start with the Eagle guys. Um, Mitch Orpit is our Eagle member from Illinois. You met him as he introduced this, this particular webinar. Um, second, we've got Allison Crane. She is our Eagle member from California. And third, we've got Kelly Baird, our Eagle member from Louisiana. Our non-Eagle participant in this one is Miles Link. He is the Senior Assistant Disciplinary Counsel in the District of Columbia Office of Disciplinary Council. And I think you're gonna really enjoy this particular panel. So I will turn it over to Mitch. Thanks guys. Uh, as Dan indicated, we are uh, here, here this morning on, on kind of a different subject. Um, it's not exactly a pure insurance subject at all, but I think it has some very interesting and potentially dramatic uh, ramifications for insurance companies and claims professionals. Um, I wanted to first uh, reintroduce myself, Mitch Orpit from Chicago, Triple Orpit and Meyer, uh, and I am chair of Eagle, and it's partly because of that that I wanted to address this uh, topic as part of this program, as much for Eagle as, as for uh, you and our audience. Uh, so first, let me introduce my co-panelists. Um, that's number one, to make sure that I don't do what I did at one of our live conferences and get about halfway through the program before I introduce them. Uh, so I'll do that now. And secondly, it's, uh, it's my way of making sure they're actually here since I can't see them. Uh, our first, uh, we have, and we have a tradition at Eagle uh, that because our information for our Eagle members is available on the website at eagle-law.com, uh, that we don't go into very lengthy biographies uh, extolling our virtues and, and leave it to you to, uh, to do your due diligence on us and, and check out our, our bios on the website. Uh, so my introduction of our Eagle members on the panel is, is short. Uh, first is Allison Crane, and Allison is named partner at Bledsoe Diesel Treppa and Crane in San Francisco, California. She is also the chair-elect of Eagle, will follow me as chair, and is current, currently uh, chair of our Emerging Issues Committee, and I think this topic uh, today is certainly one of those that cons uh, constitutes an emerging issue. So, Allison, you're here, I assume. Say hello. Do we have Allison? Yes. There we go. Okay. And uh, also with us is Kelly Theard from uh, one of our newer members, uh, firm members, uh, Deutsch and Kerrigan in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, Deutsch and Kerrigan is our, our Louisiana member. And Kelly is the firm's first female manager. Uh, for a managing partner and uh, bring some interesting perspectives uh, to this panel uh, based on that as well. Uh, not subject to our short uh, intro uh, tradition is when we have outside uh, experts and people who have, and I should say, Kelly, are you there? I should I'm confirm here. that before moving on. Great, thank you. And uh, our outside expert today, uh, not an Eagle member, uh, but someone I've, I've known for years is Miles Link. Miles is a member of the bar, is a lawyer, member of the bar in New York, Massachusetts, in the District of Columbia, currently uh, based in D.C. Uh, and he work, worked as a, uh, a partner, I'm sorry, as, a, as a, an attorney in a national law firm before becoming professor of law at uh, the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. He is currently the Senior Assistant Disciplinary Counsel for Appellate Litigation at the District of Columbia Office of Disciplinary Counsel, and uh, certainly from that perspective will bring some interesting ethics and professionalism uh, perspectives to this topic today. 
Uh, I got to know Miles through the American Bar Association uh, about 20 or so years ago. Uh, Miles chaired the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice and served on its Commission on Racial and Ethnic Diversity in the Legal Profession. He's also chaired the ABA Standing Committee on Legal Ethics and Professional Responsibility, the Standing Committee on Professional Regulation, and the Special Committee on Bioethics and the Law. Um, Miles and I worked on a program years ago uh, with the Tuskegee University Center uh, for Bioethics, where we dealt with a uh, program on bioethics, minorities, and the law. He's long been an expert in this area, and we're absolutely delighted uh, that he could join us today to present uh, his areas of, of expertise and insights in this topic to you. So good morning, Miles. You're there too, I assume. Good morning, yes. Great, thank you. So. Um, in honor of Dan Ripper being chair of this conference, I thought that I would tell a Tennessee story to kick off this uh, part of the program. Um, when, when I was in eighth grade, I got to play the part of uh, Henry Drummond in the play Inherit the Wind, uh, which is a fictionalized version of the Scopes trial in 1925 or 1926 in which uh, Drummond, the character is based on Clarence Darrow, defended uh, a teacher in Dayton, Tennessee, uh, for teaching evolution. Uh, the prosecution brought in uh, William, uh, William Jennings Bryan, three-time presidential candidate and a famed orator and um, rather fundamentalist uh, preacher background. And the play talks about the conflict between rather progressive uh, Darrow character and the more conservative uh, William Jennings Bryan. In the beginning of the play, in the day before the trial starts, and this is where it's fictionalized because the two attorneys the day before trial are just sitting around talking to each other uh, as opposed to being neck deep in work, uh, but they're sitting there talking to each other, and they start kind of reminiscing about how in the past they had worked together on a lot of the same issues. And William Jennings Bryan turns to Clarence Darrow and says, this is in the play, and says, remember all these times we worked together, we had a lot of the same causes, we shared a lot of the same ideas. Why is it over the years you have moved so far away from me? And Darrow looks at him, thinks for a bit, and says, well, perhaps it's you who've moved away from me by standing still. The implication being that Darrow had continued to learn, continued to progress, continued to refine his thinking over the years, and his accusation was that uh, William Jennings Bryan character had remained stagnant, had refused to consider new items, new things like science uh, and progress and had remained stuck in the past and therefore they had diverged. So we recognize, just by way of a brief introduction here, uh, we recognize that in talking about a, a topic like implicit bias, uh, we are treading into an area that is not a, exactly a common uh, insurance claims conference topic. So why are we doing it? Uh, as chair of, of, of this organization, I thought it was really important that we look at this issue, um, but I think it is also something that is particularly timely. Uh, while, while I was uh, sitting here looking at, at some emails as, as the conference was going on, uh, still another magazine came across my, my, my desk uh, with another implicit bias topic, and you begin to see it more and more, certainly current events has brought this uh, to the fore. Uh, so it's a timely topic. I think it's one that is particularly informative uh, for us all. Um, I think we can all do better at understanding uh, subconscious biases and distancing ourselves from them, learning how to distance ourselves from them. But I also think that it has some very practical and important implications for insurance companies and, and the resolution of claims. Uh, I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of, of material out there on this topic, but I can see it. Um, I see it in, in, the, in an example where an insurance company fairly recently in, entered into a $6 million settlement of a uh, claim, a, a regulatory uh, investigation by a state 
claiming discriminatory practices in the underwriting field, which is a little easier to understand. But in the description of some of the concerns raised in the investigation, I noticed things talking about, as, as the last panel said, about pattern and practices. And I thought that there would be some implications there for a potential of, of similar concerns in the claim side as well. So I think that there are some insurance implications here that we ought to consider. Um, so here we are. I, I recognize, and I, I hope you do, um, that again, it's not a typical topic. Uh, it's one that we are basically inviting discomfort, and we recognize that. Uh, talking about bias within ourselves uh, is not meant to be accusatory. It's not meant to be judgmental. It is, is something that more and more people believe is is a part of, of all of us and, and is a subject we think that is worth looking at. Uh, it is certainly not our intent. Uh, no, no lawyer wants to, to come to a, uh, a client's conference and insult the client. So we're not doing anything today to, to do that. We hope you don't take anything we say as, as any kind of accusation. Um, again, it's a subject that is, is important and, and overreaching it applies to all of us. Um, so we hope that by looking at the topic with an open mind, listening, reflecting, and considering, if we do those things, uh, this will have been a very successful uh, hour. Uh, I will I will initiate this and, and, and kind of emphasize my point on this by uh, revealing, confessing that uh, yesterday in, in preparation for this, this topic discussion today, I took the, uh, and you'll hear some reference to this, uh, the implicit bias, uh, one of the implicit bias tests. There's a famous uh, series of tests that you can find at implicit.harvard.edu, put out by Harvard University. Uh, I came out moderately, uh, uh, having moderate implicit bias, which was kind of a middle category, but definitely a bias category. Um, and, and the one I was dealing with dealt with race and weapons. Uh, so there are some things that were surprising to me as I took it. And um, you know, we can all look at these things with some degree of, of questions and, and maybe some degree of skepticism. But the question raised uh, are, are legitimate questions. So we hope to look at those today. And we would do so by initially having Miles talk to us and give us a bit of a primer on implicit bias, what it is, what it isn't. Um, and, and kind of go over the landscape of, of how we are, where we are. And then we'll turn uh, at, after that uh, brief presentation to uh, more of a discussion about how this may impact and, and how it may have ramifications in the insurance claims field. So with that, Miles, again, thanks for being here and sharing your time and expertise with us. And I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Mitch, uh, thank you very much. and. Um, I just want to say, um, and Mitch Orpet is someone who has thought uh, carefully and, and, and thoughtfully about these issues for a very long time. He, he referenced the program we did at Tuskegee about 20 years ago uh, when he was chair of the TIPS uh, section of the ABA, and he's, he's just been a real leader in this area. That is reflected in the uh, memo um, uh, outline he did for this program, and it's in your materials. It's entitled uh, Beating Back Bias in Insurance Claims Before the PQ, a Discussion of Implicit Bias uh, in the Settlement of Claims and the Dangers Faced if Unresolved. And it's actually a very excellent uh, uh, piece of work, and I refer you all to it. He also mentioned the um, test uh, that we can all take. It's, it's posted uh, at Harvard and it's at implicit.harvard.edu. It's called uh, the Implicit Association Tests. Um, interestingly enough, when you log on to it, you'll see a Canadian uh, flag in, in, in one of the emails. It's, it's, it's a joint project. Uh, this is not just uh, related uh, to the United States, but it's a, it, it, it's a very good test uh, for people to self-administer and I would urge all of you to uh, just take it and just see uh, what it shows. The reason for that is we all have implicit bias. I do, um, we all do. And, it's, and what is implicit bias? Can, can we show the first slide, please?
It's um, the Kirwan Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at Ohio State University, which is one of the leaders in this area and which has a tremendous amount of information, uh, defines implicit bias as the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. And um, attitudes, stereotypes, beliefs, and associations um, that we have and we bring to um, our interaction with others. It causes us to have feelings about other people based on characteristics such as race, gender, ethnicity, age, and appearance. Now notice what's missing from that list of uh, factors. What's missing is personal knowledge of the individual you're dealing with. When you meet an individual, you can usually identify their race, usually their gender, uh, their, often their ethnicity, uh, often their age, and you obviously uh, relate to their appearance. Is it neat? Is it not? Is it very avant-garde? Is it very traditional? And all of those factors cause us to have feelings and predispositions about that individual. One of the things to think about when we deal with implicit bias, first of all, we're not talking about overt discrimination, overt bias. We're not talking about people taking actions based on others or based on their observations that they understand are uh, discriminatory. It's associations and assumptions you make about others based just on these factors here. Can we go to the next slide, please? And they result from various associations, uh, messaging we receive over a lifetime. Information we take in, beginning as children, um, it affect how we relate to other people. Um, a, a sort of a point of personal uh, reference, I, I pr uh, was a professor for many years, for 20 years, at the College of Law at Arizona State University. Arizona has one of the largest, if not the largest, group of Native American, American Indian communities and tribes and nations uh, throughout the state. Coming as I do from New York City, um, this was a new experience for me, dealing with a large number of American Indian, Native Americans as colleagues on the faculty, as students in my classes, and as people in the community. What implicit assumptions, what implicit um, uh, biases, if you will, did I have about uh, these people? Um, I'm, I, I know that I had some, uh, and they were not based on any personal knowledge of any um, uh, particular individual. They were based on a lifetime's work of um, information, um, assumptions uh, gathered uh, from others. And that's what we're talking about here, and that's why we say everyone uh, has it. We've often, um, a study was done by a, two sociologists, a, a one from Marquette University, one from Texas Christian, where they looked at how apartments were rented by landlords when they didn't meet the people who were contacting them for information about the apartment, and they did not meet them directly, what they obtained were emails from these individuals. And the question was, how did they respond to these emails? And so these professors sent some mock email messages inquiring about a rental unit. Some of the emails were signed with a black sounding name and some with a white sounding name. Now, by the way, the very fact that we associate race with some names is interesting. We associate religion with some names we associate nationality with some names, and we associate ethnicity with some names. Um, and, and we also associate race with some names. So someone named O'Reilly, we associate as Irish or Irish American, and when we meet them, they may turn out to be African American. Um, someone Goldberg, we associate with a, a Jewish person, uh, someone, um, Rashan or Jamal, we associate with African-Americans. And again, we do that not because we know that individual, 
personally, we haven't met them yet, but simply because that's what our society tells us, that's what we intuited from our society, society those names represent. So in any event, these emails were signed with a black sounding name and some with a white sounding name. Some of the emails included language to indicate whether the applicant was of high or low economic status. For example, a high economic status email would have better grammar and spelling and include more formal greetings and closing. A high economic status email would also offer additional information, such as noting that the person had good references. Otherwise, the emails were equivalent. There was no uh, other difference. And the findings showed that on average, landlords exhibited a bias toward white sounding names. They responded to them 6.3% more frequently than to black sounding names. And the bias, interestingly enough, was most pronounced in, if both applicants were of low economic status. In that case, the landlords would respond to the white sounding name email 17.5% more often then they would respond to a black sounding uh, email, even though they were of equivalent economic status and therefore would be expected to be able or not able to pay the rent uh, similarly. One of the things with, when, we, when we prepared for this panel, I, we're, we're living in an interesting moment in American history today, um, uh, not just obviously the pandemic, but also the, the resurgence of the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Um, uh, over the past decade, we've, we've seen a number of uh, shootings of, of, or other um, uh, killings of Blacks uh, at the hands of police officers, and many of these have resulted in substantial settlements, substantial payments uh, to the families of the deceased. For example, Brianna Taylor, uh, the young woman from Lexington, Kentucky, who was an African-American in her 20s, emergency medical technician. Uh, it's just been announced that her family is going to receive a $12 million payment uh, from Lexington, Kentucky. And I, and I thought to go back and look at some of the other settlements and see what they were and, and, and why the settlement might have been what it was. I was surprised, for example, to find that in 2014, the family of Tamar Rice a 12-year-old African-American boy in Cleveland, Ohio, received only a $6 million settlement. I would have thought, given his youth and, and given his, his untapped potential, he, they might have received more. And I wondered, if he had been a white 12-year-old boy, would, he have, would the family have received more than $6 million? Also in 2014, the family of Eric Garner, uh, an African-American man, he was 44 years old, in New York City, he was killed uh, by a police officer in Staten Island, put in a chokehold and killed. They received $5.9 million in a settlement. And again, I wondered, would they have received more if he had been uh, not African-American, but a white American? When you go forward, in 2016, in Chicago, Illinois, a African-American woman, 55 years old, Betty Jones, was killed by mistake uh, by a police officer in an exchange of gunfire uh, with a suspect. Actually, it wasn't an exchange of gunfire. The police officer fired at a, uh, someone coming at him with a baseball bat, or he thought was coming at him with a baseball bat, and this uh, a woman was killed uh, in the, uh, by, by mistake, and her family received a $16 million settlement. So that was quite a, a, a large uh, settlement. But the largest settlement I found was a settlement in 2017 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, for the uh, shooting death of a white Australian woman, Justin Rosniak Damon, uh, and her family uh, received $20 million. And um, one wonders uh, had she been African American, would there have been some? explanation accepted that the police officer felt uh, he was under threat. Uh, this uh, Resniak was, a, was a, a blonde, very white woman from Australia, and uh, that explanation simply uh, could not hold water. Interestingly enough, also in 2017 in, in Minneapolis, 
a uh, uh, African American a man, Hispanic man, Philandro Castile, was also uh, shot and killed, and his um, uh, girlfriend, who was in the car with him, received a settlement of only eight hundred thousand dollars. And when she received the settlement, a city council member, mayor of a small town, uh, tweeted that um, uh, she didn't deserve that much money. Her her young child, uh, baby, was in the car when the when uh, Mr. Castile was shot with with the seven. Uh, Officer fired seven times, five bullets hit him, and, and with the baby in the car. Um, and the, the, the uh, uh, city council member, uh, mayor, said she didn't uh, deserve the money because um, she was African American and the money was going to be spent on crack, uh, crack cocaine. And he posted that notice. Now, she had no history of drug abuse or drug use, um, certainly no history of crack cocaine use. and um, he ultimately uh, had to, uh, she sued uh, him and, and, and his city for that statement, I think the city of St. Anthony, Minnesota. And he ultimately had to apologize. I don't know if he paid me money, but he did post an apology uh, for, uh, for that um, uh, statement. As insurance companies and their lawyers and their claims adjusters uh, face these issues today, one of the things they will have to deal with are how do they value the life that's been lost? How do they value it? And to what extent race, ethnicity uh, plays a factor in that um, valuation? Um, it's interesting, the, the very phrase Black Lives Matter has, is often misunderstood to mean only Black Lives Matter. That, that of course, is not the meaning at all. The meaning is historically black lives have, have mattered less than other lives. And so what the phrase is intended to mean is black lives matter, comma, two, T-O-O. -O. Black lives matter as well as other lives. And it's, it's a way to sort of push back against assumptions people make that black lives are not worth as much as other lives. Again, uh, in uh, Native American communities, um, the uh, incident of uh, Native American men and women who are killed um, in, in violent out outbursts uh, by uh, local white community members or by law enforcement is the highest in the country. And they, their view is those lives matter as well. And it's that, this is sort of an, ex uh, sort of a, a, an issue about to the extent implicit bias affects how we value those who are different, how we uh, understand those lives, whether we take the effort to understand them, and for an insurance conference, how we value those lives and whether or not we put, we place a different value uh, on those lives. Um, uh, as as, as um, Mitch pointed out in his outline, insurance claims professionals and defense lawyers evaluate claims and make recommendations as to amounts of settlement and expected jury verdicts on a daily basis. So you are asked to put a value on those lives, whether they are lost or whether they are injured or otherwise impacted, whether their property is damaged, and to, how do you do that and to what extent uh, is your, uh, are implicit biases affect those valuations? Now, I don't want to suggest that in all instances, we're dealing with sort of life and death issues and that um, implicit bias doesn't affect us in other ways. On a, on, on a personal note, as I was growing up, um, uh, went off to, to, to college. I grew up in New York City, went off to college in Massachusetts. And uh, whenever I go out to, to play basketball with, with, with the, and, and the group was, uh, the other players were, were white, they would look at me and, and they'd know I came from New York. They'd know I was African-American. And the assumption was I was a great basketball player. And so everyone wanted me on their team. Well, of course, I wasn't a great basketball player, but I didn't tell them that because I liked the implicit bias that I was a great basketball player and that I should be uh, on, their, on their team. I would suggest that everyone in this conference benefits to some extent from the bias in your favor because you are all 
are college educated. Uh, some of you have law degrees, other advanced degrees. And when you interact with others, your demeanor, your presentation of self, your uh, ability to use good grammar and good English, uh, people, you get credit for that. And, and, so, and so that tips people in your favor. And that's the point that implicit bias is based on assumptions we make about others, based on the cues we get from those others, and those cues we measure in light of uh, information we have absorbed uh, in our lives. Can we go back to slide number two, please? Okay, can we go to this? Um, the, the, the third point on that slide, uh, implicit bias tends to line up with general social hierarchies. That is to say, um, on the um, uh, uh, rental of the apartment uh, uh, example, if the name looks to be a black name, an African-American name, because in the social hierarchy, African-Americans are uh, viewed as uh, lower down on the, on the hierarchy than white Americans, if the name appears to be that, they will get inferior treatment, uh, they may get higher, be quoted a higher rental price um, in the insurance context. They may have to, they may get quoted a higher insurance rate because of the bias, uh, because of the negative bias associated uh, with that name. Can we go to the third slide, please? And uh, that's why uh, it, it it matters. It, it, we we um, have long-term harmful effects. And, and again, let's stop here for a minute. I talk about harmful effects, but why do we um, utilize implicit bias at all? What, what, um, what function does it serve? Well, it makes initial contacts and initial interaction easier. Um, you meet someone, you don't know them, but they are white, um, they are black, uh, they are Hispanic, um, and you associate certain things with those characteristics. They are a man, they are a woman. You associate certain characteristics with those, uh, certain assumptions with those characteristics, and that frankly helps facilitate uh, a conversation. Um, I'm looking at, at a, uh, an African American, I don't know him, but I've never met him, but he looks, you know, um, fairly. Uh, well, you know, early competence. So I'll ask him, hey, what do you think about uh, the NBA playoffs uh, right now? And, and you sort of an icebreaker, you're, you're gonna make an assumption he knows something about the NBA and, um, uh, and, 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 and therefore I'm gonna make that assumption. When I, was, when I was teaching, I taught a course on Homer's Iliad uh, to uh, 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 sort of an adult, uh, adult education course affiliated with the university. And what was striking was that for the first few classes, the uh, mostly white audience were not so much listening to what I was saying. They were just amazed that it was an African-American saying it, that it was an African-American who knew who Homer was or who knew what the Iliad was and was actually uh, uh, making connected sentences in connection with it. Um, that, that's the sort of um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a much smaller basis uh, and, a, and a much less serious basis, uh, some of the ways in which implicit bias affects us. Um, it's directly connected to systemic and structural inequality. Uh, those are terms, systemic and structural inequality, that are big terms. Uh, they're being used a lot today. Um, there's in, 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 in America, they are very uh, flashpoint terms because we think of this as a country of opportunity and a country of, of, of individual uh, expressions of success and ability uh, based on that opportunity. And the notion that inequality is systemic or structural is difficult uh, to uh, accept. Uh, and yet, implicit bias can help to perpetuate uh, that social hierarchy we see 
uh, in our society. As I said before, they're pervasive. Everyone possesses them. Judges do. Uh, even uh, the Code of Judicial Conduct commits them to impartiality, and yet they have to work at that impartiality to overcome implicit bias. Um, it can predict behavior, and this behavior can harm people who are members of marginalized groups. Now, in his outline, um, Mitch talks about ways to uh, address implicit bias, and I want to go over some of the points he makes. Um, first, be motivated. Um, you need, and, and I think everyone in this audience, given your profession and given the work you do, uh, would be motivated to address this issue in order to provide uh, the kind of service your clients and your companies demand. In order to do that, to provide that, you need to be self-observant and self-critical. The first thing is to admit we all have it. Um, how do we express it? As we think about people, as we think about issues, what do we bring to those thoughts that reflect the, our bias and again, because we're dealing with people, we don't have information about the individual uh, directly. What are we bringing to that conversation that is uh, biased? Remind ourselves that we all have it um, and make yourself uncomfortable. Um, that's one of the points Mitch made at the beginning. Um, this is not a comfortable uh, thing to think about or talk about publicly and, or even to ourselves, but it's necessary. It's necessary that we grapple with it in order to overcome it. Um, and finally, expose yourself to counter uh, uh, stereotypical situations. Uh, make yourself uncomfortable. Uh, here, here's an interesting question for each of you. How many of you uh, have friends uh, or colleagues who are not like you, with whom you actually have meaningful interactions. Um, uh, years ago in the, in, in the 1950s, uh, uh, most interaction between, or actually earlier than that, uh, between whites and, and, and African Americans would have been um, uh, very uh, stereotypical. Mm. Um, a maid, uh, uh, someone who, who, who cleaned, someone who worked in a service capacity would be the extent of the interaction. And that was due to segregation and other factors. Well, today we don't have those de jure ways to separate us, but to what extent are we separated by other factors? To what extent do you interact with people of a different religion? To what extent do you interact with people who, um, for whom English is not their uh, native language? Um, how do we get to know people without, in fact, getting to know them? And um, that's, that's something we should think about, and that's something we should uh, try to expand uh, our points of reference so that we have fewer instances where we need to utilize our bias because we have no points of reference. And then finally, um, uh, think about counter uh, uh, stereotypical situations. For example, um, one of the ways in which women face uh, uh, implicit bias is they are not perceived by men to be leaders, and in some instances by other women to be leaders. They have to overcome the implicit bias that they cannot lead an organization uh, that includes men uh, as, as, as well as women. Well, if you're a man and, and, and you're, uh, uh, working with, with women, how well do you function when a woman is leading the team, when a woman is in charge? Um, and if you don't function well in that environment, think about why you don't function well in that environment, and what about your predilections and bias uh, impact uh, those decisions. So uh, Mitch, I hope that sort of helps to sort of introduce uh, the issue, uh, which uh, the other panelists are going to discuss with more particular uh, perspective and relevance uh, to the subject matter of this overall conference. Uh, that's great, Miles. Thank you very much. It was a uh, 
it's a, it's a difficult subject, a broad subject with a lot of different tentacles. And uh, I thought you did a great job kind of focusing in on its key components. Uh, so thank you for that. And you raise a lot of interesting questions. And I want to focus now on the possible ramifications. Miles mentioned some of them in dealing with uh, wrongful death cases, for example. Uh, but I think it's more, even more mundane uh, kind of daily basis uh, than, than just a big wrongful death case. Uh, mentioned uh, some of the specific issues dealing with, with uh, gender, dealing with females in leadership roles. We have a couple on the panel. Um, so I want to uh, turn, Allison, to uh, maybe your reactions to some of what you see in the practice of law in dealing with claims uh, that we do on a regular basis. And, and how you see this potentially uh, intersecting with the implicit bias issues that Miles addressed. Absolutely. Uh, I just want to check my audio. There were some issues during the introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Sounds Perfect. good. So, you know, there are some professions in which those individuals may not be dealing with implicit bias on some of their day-to-day -day operations. A, a geotechnical engineer who's evaluating a drainage analysis probably doesn't have to think a whole lot about implicit bias in his or her data. But we as lawyers and claim professionals are dealing fundamentally with people. We are dealing with people's stories. We are dealing with our assessment of those individuals, of their credibility, the credibility of witnesses. And as Miles mentioned, we are ultimately putting a value on that claim, that story that is being brought forth based not only on our assessment of liability, but our assessment of the presentation of that individual and that individual's damages. And ultimately trying to project what 12 of our fellow citizens are going to think in terms of the value of that claim. And each one of us has these mental shortcuts that we may employ in coming to those conclusions. And so ultimately that can affect how we interact with all of the different people that exist in the process. Everything from your insurers and our clients, what relationships do we develop with the clients who come through our door? Do we develop stronger relationships with people who look like us, for people who have familiarity to us in some way? Is it harder for us to make a connection to people who we don't have familiarity with? Is it, do we, does it affect our advocacy over time? Certainly not in any conscious way. Certainly nobody would say that we treat someone differently because of who they are or how they present themselves or whether we feel comfortable with that person. But it is these subtle and unconscious biases that, that we all have that we need to be able to acknowledge to see how they affect our relationships and how they affect ultimately the decision-making process that we use. And so if we can accept that concept that we can't entirely de-bias ourselves, can we look at each one of these relationships we have with our clients and our insureds, with opposing counsel, with, um, with each other, and see ways that we can improve those and, and think more critically about each one of those relationships. So can I jump Wonder, in? Yeah, please do, Kelly. So I so I am I'm the new girl on the block here, and I have to tell y'all that when Mitch called and asked if I would be on this program, I thought it was a hazing. I was being hazed <laughs> um, because you know it's absolutely true how uncomfortable it is, and it has been really fascinating to me um, in preparing for this program to really sit back and, and analyze myself um, and how not only. Um, am I recognizing how maybe other people's um, biases are affecting me, but how I'm using them in my, in my career um, and how I analyze a case. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've recognized is as simple as when an insured gets a call from me and I tell them that I'm their attorney and I do a lot of construction litigation or I handle a lot of trucking accidents and some restaurant stuff but when they get a call from me especially the construction side they they do not want to talk to me about it because they just assume I'm not going to understand it um, which 
you know, one of the things I've always expl- I've always said is my not understanding it, if that were true, is is a benefit to you because if I can understand it, I can explain it to a jury who may not understand it. Um, so that has been one way that I've dealt with it personally, but also just in the way that I approach a deposition of a fact witness. I've started to think about the questions that I ask, I ask a fact witness have nothing to do really um, other than my trying to um, answer some questions of my own implicit biases. For example, you know, what does it matter for a fact witness who was involved in a car accident, a plaintiff involved in a car accident as to uh, what their family background is, uh, where they went to school, or what Mardi Gras cruise do they belong in, um, or who, you know, what area of the city they live in. In, in. in New Orleans, those things are so innate in us to think, oh, if you live in this part of the city, I automatically have an idea about you. Um, and that's what this has shown me. That couldn't be less um, appropriate. <laughs> I feel like I'm in therapy on this program. <laughs> um, but it's really, I think it's going it's to be, it's interesting to start thinking about it that way. I mean, the things that I care about around how the accident happened and where were you before and who was involved and not really how many kids do you have and do you know their names? And the only reason I want to know that is because I think I want to make them look bad or a jury may not like them if they don't know you know, all the names of their kids. And um, so to me, it's really opened my eyes uh, just in, and I'm just at the very beginning stages of it. And I might have to make an appointment with Miles, I feel like, <laughs> um, for a lot more therapy on this. But it's, it's, it really does happen every single day in every case that we're dealing with from the minute I get on the phone with the insured and how they're perceiving me um, to how I'm taking a deposition and then, you know, preparing the matter for trial. Let me push back a little bit, maybe incorporate some of what Miles was saying about the benefits of implicit bias. Um, we as lawyers are asked, um, as I say in the paper, every day we're, we're evaluating claims. And we're also predicting what, and, and asked specifically by insurers, so, you know, such so friends in the audience, uh, to, at, to, to pro project what this is going to play like if it goes to trial. And to do that, we are making assumptions about unknown juries. We're making assumptions about the judge, some, some of which uh, we have some information, but not a lot oftentimes, but we kind of have to, it seems to me we have to use shortcuts uh, and, and do the sorts of, of shortcut thinking, Kelly, that you were just talking about of making assumptions based on what we can learn about people um, and, and recognizing that there are a lot of assumptions there. Um, so I guess the, in, in one sense, it's kind of the only weapons we have in this, but I'm wondering, Miles, if I can call on you, and, and we only have about 10 minutes left, and there's a couple issues I want to touch on. Um, so we're going to need to do bullet point short answers here. Um, but Miles, I'm wondering what you, from a, an ethics and professionalism standpoint, uh, what reflections or what, what wisdom you can give us on, on the ethics and professionalism of using what are clearly implicit biases brought to mind, brought into consciousness, but still making conclusions and valuations um, if it's based on experience and data. For example, if, if the data in Chicago, and I don't know this, I'm making it up, but if the data in Chicago is that the same injury in the same general set of facts for a, uh, a white male of, of age of 35 that it's worth X, and for a black male of the same age with the same injury and the same facts, it's going to be uh, worth X minus 25%. When I'm valuing a claim and evaluating the claim for the insurance company, and I rely on that uh, silently, but I rely on it, is there a, uh, am I being a bad ethical lawyer, bad, am I, violating areas of professionalism or ethics? The, the short answer is no. Um, and let me, let me explain why that's the answer. The ethics rules, uh, the rules of professional conduct for lawyers in effect in all the jurisdictions in the United States, obviously with slight differences in each jurisdiction, but in every jurisdiction, the preamble states, these are rules of reason. Um, and they, uh, when, you, when you're dealing with 
the rules dealing with discrimination. And the ABA uh, recently in 2016 adopted a model rule dealing with discrimination, 8.4G, which proved to be very controversial. Many jurisdictions have not adopted it. Illinois is still considering it. Um, uh, many, some jurisdictions have adopted it. Uh, but it is intended to address overt acts of discrimination where bias leads to discrimination. And even in states that don't have that rule, uh, misconduct is generally, one of the elements of misconduct is intent, mens rea. And um, where you're basing a decision on uh, data uh, that is um, uh, generated uh, for, for, for purposes of uh, making an, as accurate a decision as possible, even if it has a disparate impact, uh, that would not be uh, professional misconduct because uh, there, there's no intent on the part of the lawyer to um, uh, engage in, 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 in overt acts of discrimination. And so that, that's really one of the sort of interesting issues when you're dealing with implicit bias. Because it's implicit, it's not, um, it doesn't require a conscious action by the lawyer. I'm not going to hire this person because they're African American, or I'm not going to, um, uh, because I see this person is, is, is a woman or is Hispanic or whatever, I'm going to value their claim on that basis less than I would value the claim if it were a male or if it were uh, someone who was white. That would be an overt act of uh, discrimination. Um, but where uh, you're, you're relying on data and where the, the intent is to accurately value a, a claim and not to uh, discriminate on, on that basis, the uh, rules of professional conduct really would not clearly address that. And so uh, what, we're, what we're asking lawyers to do is to, it, th this is not something where you should do the right thing because if you don't, you'll be uh, brought up on professional misconduct charges. This is where you should do the right thing because it's the right thing. And because uh, your clients, the insurance companies and others will be able to in fact more accurately address uh, the, the needs of their insured uh, than they would otherwise. So, so let's take the data out of it then. Um, I, as I said, I don't know the specific data on that question here in Chicago, and I assume that, that often in evaluating claims, lawyers don't know the data. So, so Kelly or Allison, uh, do you find situations in which some of these assumptions are built into your evaluations or to an insurance company's evaluation when they're giving you settlement authority or to in, in, in situations with trial or dealing with juries or anything like that? Well, there's certainly the situations uh, that people have probably encountered in their um, experiences where there is a belief about a certain plaintiff about not what the objective value of the case is based on the injuries and the damages that are presented, but what is the value of this case to that person? This would be a lot of money to that person. We can settle this case in a different way than we would if the plaintiff were in a different situation because of some characteristic of that plaintiff that we have drawn conclusions about. Um, or, the perceived value, as was mentioned earlier, um, with respect to uh, the settlement uh, for the girlfriend. We have some perception as to what this person is going to do with the money, and that somehow affects our valuation of the case. If this person isn't going to put the money to what we perceive to be good use, then does that affect how much we are willing to pay for a claim, as opposed to evaluating it based on objective data? And, and one of the places that, that that can become problematic in application, not just looking at it from the perspective of what is fair and what is right, but is whether our perceptions about the case as lawyers and claims professionals are going to differ from what a jury will think of that case. 
a jury that may be more demographically diverse in terms of its racial, ethnicity, ethnic, and socioeconomic background. So when we impose our judgments on a case, our assessments of the worth of a case based on things that aren't the objective data in the case, we may create a perception or a situation where we've undervalued a case and we're not settling a case at mediation, we're not doing what is ultimately in the best interest of ourselves and our insureds and getting that case into a courtroom where the verdict value may look very different from what our value judgment on that case was. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think what it does is that it's making us miss questions, right? Like we create now a story um, and now we only look for the evidence that supports our story or the information that supports our story rather than being a little bit more open-minded um, as to other possibilities because we've already decided before, you know, before we're out of the gate. Um, so I definitely think it has an impact on, on how we're evaluating the cases and, and you know, making recommendations. I think that's an, uh, both excellent points. Um, the, the need to focus on, on this um, in part, I think, is, is to enable us to be more accurate and, and by seeing past kind of the, uh, the opaqueness that is created by implicit bias and, and, and missing what we ought to see, whether it's in the questions to witnesses at depositions or the questions to jurors and voir dire. Uh, or just the evaluation uh, that, that we miss factors that we would otherwise see if we didn't have some uh, short-sightedness due to implicit bias. Um, Kelly, I wanted to uh, enable you to continue your therapy session here um, by look, by having you comment, if, if you wish, on, on the, uh, the gender issue that Miles mentioned specifically uh, that I assume may apply in your situation as as a relatively new managing partner, being the first uh, female managing partner. I know you mentioned that right after you took over, the virus hit, so I assume that everybody blames you for that. Um, <laughs> but, but obviously bias takes place, uh, implicit bias takes place in, the work, in our workplaces as well. So do you have a, a minute or so on, uh, on, to sum up on, on your experience thus far on that issue? Sure. Um, I'll tell you, this is a lot cheaper than my normal therapy, so I appreciate the time. Um, yeah, you know, so I became the first managing, female managing partner in 94-year history of the firm in New Orleans. And um, mostly men, there's only, we've only had six female partners in the entire 94 history. So I think it became, it was, um, it was a really big shock to most people. I still find I walk into rooms and people when I walk into the room with another, with a male partner, even though I'm the managing partner, we just had evaluations of our younger lawyers, they will turn and look at the male partner rather than me. Um, and I don't think it's done in any intentional way, but I, I will like politely, you know, start talking and making sure they turn my direction or I'll have now the other lawyer sit next to me um, rather than him sit at the other side. Um, I, I really think that everyone's been pretty open-minded. I find that because of the COVID situation, it's been interesting. People say, oh, I was so good for this position because I was much more nurturing than maybe my male counterparts would have been, um, which was interesting. And I, you know, and I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I've, you know, I've, my husband wouldn't call me that nurturing. So I think it's fascinating <laughs> that they thought so. Um, but yeah, it's been, I mean, it's still early on, but it, I know Allison's probably had this experience as females. I'll walk in a deposition and I'm asked if I'm the court reporter still. We're, we're not past that. Um, and I don't take it at any offense. It's just kind of still people's natural inclination. Um, but so far everyone's responded pretty well, but it helps that they're not in the office a whole lot. So. Uh, well, we can. I, I, I wanna just correct uh, in your introduction, you started to say I was a partner, and then you said I was an attorney at my firm. Actually, I was a partner for 15 years uh, before I went into uh, teaching, and I was the first African-American, and actually the only African-American partner at that firm uh, in its, uh, in its uh, over 100-year uh, history. So um, I can certainly relate to some, I was not the managing partner, but I can certainly relate to some of the things Kelly is saying. I'm gonna call you, Miles. I'm calling you. <laughs> 
We're gonna, you know, for the, uh, con the the concern about being uh, labeled as a court reporter, we'll we'll reprise this topic in about 20 years, and then we can talk about ageism and the biases that go with that as well. <laughs> um, we're 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 at the end of our hour, um, but I want to thank uh, the three of you for for your frank and and uh, brave conversation about uh, a difficult topic, a, a sensitive topic, um, and I just want to close by. Um, Again, touching on what I think is a an economic part of this uh, potential, I, I see a risk to insurance companies for perceived unintended implicit bias or implicit discrimination in patterns and practices about how claims are valued and paid. And I think it, and, and I'm not, uh, as I say in the paper, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the economics are a reason to be concerned about this topic. I think we can all be better people and we should all aim to be uh, as free from bias, implicit or otherwise, as we can possibly be. Uh, but I do think that there is an, an immediate or at least uh, po short-term potential for insurance company liability, uh, bad faith, uh, wrongful claims practices, based on a pattern and practice of devaluing uh, certain types of lives, uh, certain people's lives, or, or increasing the, decreasing the value of certain injuries. Uh, and uh, I echo what, what Miles uh, talked about in his uh, introduction to it all, which is by shining a light on, on the issue by thinking and considering and getting to know ourselves better in the way we think. Uh, we can probably go a long way to to ending that. So we are intruding, or I am, into your break, uh, which I apologize for. But thanks very much for your attention and patience with us and with us and uh, for giving us your ear. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, all of us here at Eagle are, are enthusiastic about putting these programs on and interacting with you. Uh, so if you have any feedback for us, please let us know reach out to us at the website at www.eagle-law.com or to any individual uh, that is a, a member. Uh, we're happy to talk with you, happy to get your input, any feedback, criticism you may have, if you have questions about the program, ideas about future conferences that you'd be interested in, uh, we're happy to uh, engage and talk with you about that. So thank you again for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.